So welcome everyone here today to the Open Ireland Network event. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Open Ireland Network, uh, let me give a brief introduction. Uh, it's a very new grouping. Um, it's a community uh, that we have set up to help everyone in the open ecosystem in Ireland connect together and to examine both the opportunities and challenges that are presented by the open uh, innovation in Ireland. Um, everything that 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 open can, can can encompass, everything from open source software to hardware to open standards and open data and open innovation and open research. In fact, the open opportunity seems to be very, very broad indeed. And um, in many respects, this is part of what the Open Ireland Network is about, to examine the breadth of that opportunity, but also to, oppor to identify any opportunities that may happen in the various different aspects of the open ecosystem in Ireland. Just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Claire Dillon, and I've been involved in developer ecosystems here in Ireland for over 20 years now. But only in the last few years have I become aware of the opportunity that is surrounding and the growth that is happening in the open source software movement uh, globally. And it became obvious to me that perhaps we needed to do something to bring together everyone in Ireland who is already so active in that, in that area and um, to connect them together to look at how we can advance that whole idea in Ireland. Um, and in doing so, I met a lot of people who were involved in open source hardware and open data and in other areas of open. And it, it, it is really great to see that, that so many people then are coming together to be able to uh, address, as I said, both the opportunities and challenges that this entire open ecosystem presents. So before we kick off uh, with our speakers, or while I'm introducing our first speaker, I would encourage you all to introduce yourself into the Q&H uh, chat function. It's not quite a chat, um, but we would. I would love it if you could introduce yourself and maybe what brings you here today, um, because the Open Ireland Network is all about making connections. So we hope that people will be able to um, share uh, what brings them here today, and, and maybe we'll get some new connections out of that. But without further ado, I am going to first of all introduce you to John Laban, our first speaker here today. Um, as I mentioned, the open ecosystem and, and everything to do with open is, is quite a broad set of topics. Um, and I met John very early on in my journey here in Ireland. Uh, he is involved in so many non-for-profits that are involved in open technology. For example, the Open Compute Project and Open UK, and he's been incredibly helpful in terms of helping me understand the whole world of open source hardware um, and the opportunities that in particular can present to the data center industry here in Ireland and the um, benefits that it can present to Ireland, not just from an economic perspective, but also from an environmental perspective. So we've invited John here today to share that story with you because it's a story that deserves to be told often and loudly. And uh, John, if I can invite you to turn on your camera and uh, join me here on screen, um, then I, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. You can share your slides and we'll be looking forward to hearing, hearing your talk. I'll also say that we will have Q&A uh, after John's talk. Feel free to stick it in the chat as he, as he goes, <clears throat> excuse me, but also we'll have Q&A live uh, after, after his talk. So good luck, John, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much, Claire. And uh, make sure you keep a, a look on the time because I do have a tendency to overrun. I'm only supposed to be on for 20 minutes, but um, stop me in 55. So let's get my screen up. Okay, hopefully everybody can see this. So I've just had a look down on the attendees list and uh, interestingly, Scott Constable is here. And what's interesting, Scott and I just had a conversation about the, um, the moratorium on building data centres in Singapore. And we were discussing how we can decarbonise data centres so that the politicians can give permissions for uh, building data centres in big cities around the world. Um, we've had moratoriums, close downs on uh, building data centres in Amsterdam, Frankfurt, now Singapore, it will come to other cities. So this topic of decarbonisation is going to be very important as we move forward in the future. Any questions you have, please drop them in the chat and the question boxes. So I've got to kind of introduce you to the idea of how, how we measure carbon footprints. 
And there's a question here. Uh, this is basically taken from uh, a presentation I did on St. Patrick's Day for the Data Centre Alliance in the UK. And the question is, what does this glass of Irish stout have in common with the data centre carbon footprint? Now, if there are any experts here who understand scope one, scope two, scope three, greenhouse gas emissions, then you'll probably have the answer. But I'm assuming that um, there's very few people here that will understand this. So I'm gonna try and explain this relationship between the froth and the black stuff. Now, I read books and I'd recommend you read books if you wanna learn about this. And interestingly, there's a very good book here called How Bad Are Bananas? It's a book, it's been out for, I think more than six years now. And interestingly, the author is Mike Berners-Lee. And Mike Berners-Lee is the brother of Tim Berners-Lee who invented the World Wide Web. And here's Tim Berners-Lee here. Uh, and he has a real big um, interest in intellectual property and open source. And he's one of the world's biggest promoters of open source technologies and open data. So start reading that book, How Bad Are Bananas? What you'll find in that book is carbon footprints. For example, the embodied carbon in a computer is in the region of about two ton. So that one computer, the embodied energy in it, the embodied carbon is around about two ton. Now, just to quickly familiarize you with this greenhouse gas protocol. Now, this has been around since probably about 20 years now. I think it was 2001 it came out. And there are these three scopes of emissions. Now, ignore scope one, but scope two is the emissions related to the electricity that you consume. So if you're using green electricity, your scope two emissions will be very, very low. They'd be in the region of about 20 grams per kilowatt hour. If you're, in, say, in Poland, where they burn coal, then your emissions related to the use of electricity there might be say 700 grams per kilowatt hour, substantially higher. But then we have this scope free. Now the scope free, you'll hear it called supply chain embodied carbon, and there's an upstream contribution to it and a downstream into the waste stream. Now, what's interesting, most people are not measuring scope free. Uh, but this is going to be the real hot topic because as we decarbonize on the electricity and the scope two falls down to near zero, the big emissions problem is going to be what we call the embodied carbon. Now, just to show you quickly what's happening with the carbon intensity of the electricity grids, this is a, a, um, a live website, electricitymap.org. And you can go on it and you can click and you can actually see how much carbon is actually being produced as part of the electricity generation. So as you can see here, you've got all the green up here with the Scandinavians, you've got Iceland, nuclear in France, very low carbon emissions in related to the uh, carbon intensity of electricity. Here we have um, Poland. You can see very, very black, very dark because they're still on coal. But this is going to rapidly, this decade is going to turn green. And therefore, the problem is going to be the embodied carbon. And this is a, a kind of the way it's going to move. If you look here, green is the embodied carbon. And the grey is the operational carbon. Now, as you can see, it's going to change over time. So you start to see the green, that embodied carbon, the materials are going to be the real big topic that we're going to deal with. So what's the similarity between this pint of uh, Irish stout and a data center? Well, as we decarbonize the electricity grids, you're going to find that this scope two is going to really shrink down. It's going to be less than 10% of the emissions related to a data center in a very short period of time. If you're already in a green electricity generation state like Norway, then you're in this position already. But that 90% of the emissions related to the data center, this black stuff here, this is the action for this decade. How do we draw down this black stuff? How do we reduce these greenhouse gas emissions? Now, 
Open source does it in various ways. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you how we, we kind of dematerialize hardware by using open source software. Here we have 10 physical servers, no virtualization back in 2008. Then around about 2010, we got the beginnings of virtualization on server technologies. We got VMware. And we call this heavyweight virtualization. Now, when we implemented this virtualization, we saw about a 33% reduction in the physical server count. And then along came the open source community, the, the prosumers. These are the people like Facebook, Microsoft, Google, that created this lightweight virtualization system. You might have heard of lightweight Linux containers and then automated using Kubernetes. Well, what this actually does, it reduces the server hardware count even more. The motivation of the prosumer is not to have lots of equipment, is to make that equipment work harder. Well, consequently, if you look from 2008 to the open source technologies in 2018, to do the same workloads, you dematerialize by 80%. There's 80% fewer physical server nodes required to do this work. Again, this is driven by prosumers in open source communities. Another example is something Facebook did. Facebook had this real big issue that with their web servers, they just couldn't grow fast enough. So in order to attack this one, what they did, they put together a team that developed a new open source programming language called Hack. And then using this open source programming language, they developed something called a hip hop virtual machine. And when they loaded this software onto their physical server nodes, they saw an 80% reduction for the same workloads. So this is something you've got really kind of get your head around that uh, it's not just open source hardware, it's open source software as well, working together to create this really deep synergy that basically dematerializes uh, current, the old uh, proprietary technologies. Now, what we've got here, this is a, an open source server. This is the type of servers used by Facebook, by the hyperscalers. It's an open source um, server. It's specified in the OCP community. It's called an OCP cubby server. Now what's interesting about this server is its weight. Now this is a photograph that someone sent me two weeks ago as a researcher is doing a deep dive analysis, a life cycle analysis on this server to truly understand its environmental footprint. And what they were amazed about is when they put it on the scales, it weighs slightly less than five kilograms. Now, why is that special? Because it's special because all the other servers that they've been working on, the proprietary servers from HP, Dell, Cisco, those servers are weighing more than 20 kilograms. Now, again, coming back to this scope three, this embodied carbon, the lighter you can make the hardware, the less embodied carbon you have to deal with. So this is one thing that's really important. This server weighs one quarter of the weight of a traditional proprietary server, one quarter of the weight. So it has substantially lower carbon footprint. It's a different size as well. It's, it, it's a kind of a reinvention of a server. It is, and it uses at low use server utilization, this will use half the electricity energy compared to a traditional server. And at full load, it will use about 30% less energy. Now, you can go and have a look at all that information. All these reports have been done by um, users. Often CERN did the study on using these in high performance clusters and came up with 29% uh, energy savings. But the important thing to take away from this is the embodied carbon element is much, much lower. Now, all this information, this big story, this, this is all available in open source communities. You can download the specifications for that server that I just showed you. You can do like the Russians have just done. They've downloaded the specifications for, for that server in, from the Open Compute Project um, specification wiki pages, and they're making it in Russia. So they're making their own open source servers. 
Now, if Ireland were to adopt best practice, open source software and hardware today, then tomorrow morning, enterprise data centers in Ireland would reduce their carbon emissions by at least 80%. At least 80%. Now, all this technology is there, it's available, and the philosophy in open source community is go and steal from your friends, go and take the information. Now, I think that's a big, big story. I think it's a big story, and I've been going around telling this story for many, many years. But there's an issue with that story, and it's this. This here is a, one of my favorite books called The Alchemist. <clears throat> and this is just a short section from it. And what it is, the, you've got The Alchemist, this chap here, and he's with his young friend, and they're going off on this journey to find this treasure. And there they are traveling through the desert. And while they're in the desert, these two robbers come out and they rob them. They take the boy's money and they ask a question after they've searched The Alchemist what are these things in your pocket? And those things in the pocket are the, the elixir of life and these special stones, the philosopher's stones that turn base metals into gold. So he, he says that, as you can see here, he says that's what they are. And the robbers just do not believe it. They give back the philosopher's stones and they give back the elixir of life and they go off. And here we have the young boy talking to the, um, the, uh, the alchemist saying, why did you do that? Were you crazy? And the alchemist returns with, to show you, why did I do it? To show you one of life's lessons. When you possess great treasure within you, seldom are you believed. Now this technology is so radical, people don't believe. And all I'm saying is you need to get into it, become part of these communities, and then you'll see the realization. But you have to change that mindset. So that's me, very, very quickly, hoping that I might get some questions. Thank you so much, John. That's, uh, as always, uh, an amazing story. I know when um, when we first talked, like I, I was coming at this from the open source software perspective, and I wasn't aware about how I so far progressed the open source hardware scene was in terms of proving the return on investment and the benefits of adopting open source hardware. So um, it continues to amaze me. It continues to amaze me, number one, how far it's come, but that I hadn't heard about it, which is what I think everyone needs to do um, as a starting of turning that alchemist story around and people believing in the value there. Um, can you maybe uh, talk a little bit about uh, your experience about how open source hardware has, if it has, been adopted in Irish data centers um, or data centers on the island of Ireland even, um, just, just to kind of get an idea if, the, if it's happening anywhere here yet, to the best of your knowledge? Um, let me give you some, yeah, it is. The majority of um, servers in Ireland are OCP servers. Um, people just don't know it. Uh, all the big hyperscale data centers use this technology. Last year in 2020, one third of all the world's shipments of servers uh, use the OCP specification, one third. Now, the problem is that most people don't see this stuff. A, you don't go into a hyperscale data center and B, if you're in like a government data center or an typical on-premise enterprise data center, they're still stuck in the stone age. They're, they're, they're Neanderthal. They, they, all this technology has been there since 2011, but they don't, they don't follow it. They don't believe it. Uh, and part of the disbelief is the pressure of the kind of the big marketing message that they get from the big vendors, the, the HPs of this world, the Dells of this world, this big picture that they paint and, and they kind of lock you in. And they do a very good job of locking you in, in terms of the software they use. And that's a bit of a problem when you start looking at circularity, because there's this concept amongst the proprietary vendors. They have this idea that is called the, they call it the three to five year sweet spot of built in obsolescence. Now, if they stop supporting the firmware on the hardware, then you're, you're finished. You can't use that hardware anymore. Whereas what the open source communities do, they develop open source firmware. So if you want to take that server and hack it and reuse it and do something else with it, 
Similar to what some companies are doing in Europe, for example, one of the biggest um, cloud players in Europe called OVH, a French company, they take these air-cooled OCP data centers from the Facebook data centers and they convert them from air-cooled and they convert them to liquid. There's another company in Holland doing the same thing and then they're using the heat from the liquid off of the processors from the server and that heat goes into greenhouses in Holland and they grow vegetables. <laughs> so it's just, you can just do so much more with it. It's just radical what you can do. And one thing that's gonna be a big topic in the future, and it kind of touches on something, cause I know uh, Scott's here, it touches on this heat reuse. Once you can hack this gear and start to convert towards liquid heat transfer systems, you get this usable heat that's much more useful Instead of just throwing all this hot air into the clouds in the sky, you can reuse it. And that has a huge advantage in decarbonisation of the whole city economy. So it's really quite fundamental. With, without open source, you really will not achieve circularity in ICT gear. And just one fact, there's one company this year called IT Renew that will sell one million reused OCP servers, one million. That's just one company. The scale of this is huge. So, okay. So, so what I'm getting here is that number one, the servers use less energy. Number two, dramatically reduces the embedded carbon. Number three, can actually produce energy that we could then reuse on the grid or at least stop use of other energy. So we're talking like triple whammy there just from the energy use perspective alone it, like i mean that like like i find that hard to believe that this hasn't been yeah i'm the alchemist i'm the alchemist you've got <laughs> to remember i'm the alchemist but the, another thing is the when you look at it sustainability is three things sustainability is the environmental cost the social cost and the economic cost now when we start talking about sustainable data centers this decade we're talking more than energy efficiency we're talking a much broader picture yeah. now what's interesting when you look at the economic cost there's a company in, in Kenya, and I'm running some training courses for them, and they use these second user OCP servers from Facebook. And the Kenyan government have now got a policy that any money they spend on ICT technologies as of uh, August last year must be open source because they know they're going to get a better deal. When you start moving to open source, you really do slash your costs. And what they're seeing already and they only got into this a few months ago, literally a few months ago, not even a year yet, they're seeing a 60% reduction on CapEx, and they're seeing about 50% reduction in the OPEX. Because these servers are so simple, I could teach you how to change any component in there in 15 minutes, and you could change any component with no tools, there's no tools required, you could change 80% of all the components in 60 seconds and 100% of all the components in 180 seconds. Now, it would take you 10 minutes just to get the screws off the top of the conventional server. They're just superior. And it's about this big kind of gathering, this community coming together and opening up and sharing this open innovation. And it's spectacular. And it's, it's a wonderful story to be told by an alchemist. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And like I, what I really love about it is, is, is that element of that circularity and the opportunities that it can actually provide beyond even the data center in terms of the companies that are available in the ecosystem then to support that and how that's accessible to them because they can obviously get all the open you know, uh, configurations, they can get everything they need to get started without actually having to have any groundwork done. So it really levels the playing field for that. And I, I, I can see here from the Q&A, John Whelan, uh, first of all, asks is if it's an oversimplification to relate the mass of the servant to the carbon footprint. But I, but I think you see where we're going there, John, in terms of the overall like embedded carbon, you know, lighter is better, I think is in general, most people would, would, would kind of understand that. But very specifically, he was mentioning an Irish company, and I just want to call them out, uh, next Excelus.com, which converts heat from data centers, so uh, which is a TCD campus company. But obviously, there are, there are there are huge opportunities then for startups to to build upon this kind of open ecosystem and to look at those opportunities for further innovation. Um, and can you maybe talk about anywhere in the world where that's also happening? I mean, apart from the growing vegetable one, which I love, but and, and I'm sure the agri food sector here would also be interested in that. But from a technology perspective and, and thinking about that that kind of ecosystem that feeds into 
itself. Um, are there any other good examples that you have seen where people are looking at the, the, the hardware that's going into the data centers and how they've built businesses on the back of that? Yeah, um, if I could get, it's really funny because it's just so funny that Scott, who just rang me up just before this, uh, this event to talk about this Singapore issue, he's got such wonderful stories because he, he's actually a solution provider in the UK. He's one of these crazy people that thought, hang on a minute, this stuff's clever. I'm going to start using this. And they're doing really good business. Now, there's well, stories, well, we, by the we way. We can invite Scott in. I mean, this is, this is an informal gathering here. Scott, I think we can do this. <laughs> Sarah, this is this is really good. I, this is exactly what community is about. Sarah, I, and, and also I want to make a big call out to the Technology Ireland ICT Skillnet who is supporting us in this event. And Sarah, in in the in the background, I'm wondering if you can actually help us uh, have Scott Constable join us on screen. Would that be possible? If Scott is willing, um, we'd love to. Oh, and Denise, are you coming in too? <laughs> I'm I'm here because I was I was dabbling in the Q and A section. And um, Horatio Gonzalez Velas asked a really good question, uh, which I said ought to be answered live, but I didn't know that you guys saw it or not. So that's all. No, no we haven't. But now that you've drawn my attention to, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that next and maybe we'll ask Sarah in the background to see if she can bring Scott in in the meantime. But here now, uh, oh, Horacio, uh, clearly there has to be a trade-off between an open source and a closed server. Uh, what is it? Is it storage, resilience, manageability? Um, you know, commercial vendors are not dumb. Fair, fair dues, they're not. Um, so Horacio is asking, what's the trade-off between an open and closed server? I mean, is, well, are there any downsides? It's a good question. I'll you know, this, sometimes the alchemists this, don't mention absolutely. the downsides. Absolutely. I, 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 I just tell the, the good story. And I can tell lots of stories about uh, similar businesses to, to Scott. It's got to give a brief introduction. But there's, there's a company in Ireland called EP, EPS Global that I've gone, they're, they're their growth curve, since they adopted open source networking, they've gone through the ceiling. They've become a really global operation. But if I could just ask Scott, and, and it's, sorry about this, Scott, but I don't suppose you'd mind, but just tell us a little bit about some of the things that you've done and the crazy things that have happened from this. Yeah. And that little discussion we had about Barclays Bank and the 20 million pound reduction on their electricity. Go on, just a few things, just tell us the story. Well, I don't know if I've got all the answers, but it's quite interesting. It's been funny to be thrown in on this. Uh, um, so we're a system in, integrator based out of the UK. We met John, well, I met John right at the beginning when we set up the business to build it. And a lot of what John spoke about my background was NTT data, so I'd learned a lot about open and how the technical people were more pushing about open technology over OEMs, people like Oracle, because they believed that it was an oversell and actually a lot of it could be done at a lower cost. So that's what got my interest and that's what we set our business up with two of the guys, Alan and Phil. And I met John on that journey and John explained where open compute was coming from and I then got onto that whole open compute process and we're now a big uh, partner in the Open Foundation and we actually build solutions based on OCP. So where we started was ringing everybody saying this is an expert thing, you should get into it. But over a year or two, you start realizing it's not everybody's ready to take on such a crazy idea. So we've ended up building a business around software defined networking, um, around software defined storage and open compute. So some of the things that John talked about. So we don't work with OEMs, we work with ODMs, which are original design manufacturers, people who are based out of Taiwan, essentially building for HPE, building for Dell, building for all these OEMs, but now they're trying to come into the market because they're much lower cost, but they're very similar uh, components, but you're not tied in to using a HP branded drive. You're not tied in to be use some memory from HP, which is the same stuff I'm using in my kit. It's just they've added a nice big HPE tax to it or a Dell tax to it. And you get an element of support. It's like anything you buy, you get that element of support. Well, we've our job as a business localized here in Europe is to put that support around it and match what HP and, e and Dell do. So that's what we do with ODMs. They bring OCP messaging because they support people like Facebook, they support people like Microsoft, and they're bringing that technology out, seeping it out, different designs, and we consult and build those kind of servers to high performance compute, life science, managed service providers, and 
where our message falls easier is those kind of server and storage messaging. But now after five years of doing this, we are, and I was saying to John only just, is that it's quite weird. We can look at, we have a config sense and we have a big warehouse. I can look down and I've got four or five OCP racks being ready to be shipped globally around the world. And you're thinking, well, this was just an idea. This is just a concept. But the only, the other day, last week, we had a phone call from America. They'd been on the OCP um, website, seen our configurations and just called me up. And I honestly, it, that does not happen every day. So I was quite flabbergasted that I had this phone call. And now what we're doing is building a rack to send out to this other MSP because this guy gets it. He's young, he understands open source. He sees, he straight away he gets, he doesn't need the education. Whereas I think, Culturally, we're all used to just doing the exams with Cisco, doing the right, you know, just doing what's in front of us. And I think what a lot of businesses need is support to understand it, to then take it on board. I've always had a way of describing it like um, going into the sea, you'll pick up a, a snorkel and you'll give that a go, you're, you know, and I see that as just using an open server. But if you were to take an OCP rack and bring that into your data center and take on OCP messaging, then it's like uh, getting a submarine. Everybody has to get on board. You have to get a bit of money together and you're gonna focus completely to, to achieve that goal. And that's, there's a that's the kind of thing that you have to do. So we have certain businesses that have now adopted. So, if, if I can, if I can interrupt there, because I, just in terms, no, no, just because, because John was at, at like uh, suggesting as well that you have some stories, because I think you're dead right. I mean, it, you know, for me, a lot of this is, is raising awareness. People just don't know this opportunity exists because it perhaps is in a small ecosystem that's maybe a little bit uh, ironically closed because everyone talks to each other, right? So this is what this is kind of event is about. So can you maybe refer to some of the benefits, the end users of what you build, like get to, like he was mentioning the energy savings that perhaps Barclay Bank might have referred to, but do you have any like kind of stories from you, from the very end customers in terms of the benefits that this has brought them? We have a Kubernetes cloud provider uh, building Kubernetes globally. And we know that they've chosen that for power savings. That's what they've gone with an OCPAC. Ease of use, ease of manageability, less staff to, to manage this because it's all the same, it's very easy, you swap it in, you swap it out. We know he just showed one image, but all of the stuff that John says, this is what's so funny is, I bet you a lot of people just hear it as fuzz and just, yeah, 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 whatever, right? Because the way it comes across, and the reality is all of this story adds up. It all adds up. It's just, you've just got to get him. It really feels weird to come in and back him up like this. It's like I've been like, like <laughs> throwing him in now, but it's, it's true. So we have a customer who is currently building a data center out in Singapore, which is what we talked about. And they have come back to me and said, we're stuck. We tried three times. We can't get the, the go ahead. What is the best way to do it? And I had to ring John and go, I am right in saying what I'm saying is that if we built an OCP DC. We don't need all the calling that you traditionally have. We don't need that underwater, that space, that power. And, the, and all of it, I said, because it's been a while since I was like going around with the slide deck. I used to do talks on behalf of John in France at one point, didn't I? I was going to phone in, but um, I couldn't remember it all. But the reality is true. It is. OCP is the right way to do it. If you're going to anything at scale or you're looking to move into open source, you're going to make major cost savings. That's the, ma the main thing. And we do that work at Vespa. I'm not trying to sell ourselves here, but promote it in some way. Is that if you want to give us a test, you know, the, the simple thing is, you know, go and pick a Dell server and say if it's got a lot of drives in but those are always good ones because we'll show you another server with the same amount of drives maybe lower require another good example life sciences hpe all all of their well, data well, well, well we if, if it can be really short because we're about I'm to sure, transition sure. now go on go on scott get it in they rang, they rang me up they said we're looking at taking out we're running out of power in our data center so we have to look at new servers to go into that data center and what is the power pool on your servers? I did that work over a space of two days to show them, gave it to them. We won that bid and took out half of their estate to free up power. So then that new end of that step, that is a life science. So that was about 2 million pounds worth of kit. 
Well, so all, all I can say is I'm, I'm sorry we have to end this conversation. This is the conversation now. But, and we, and we haven't actually, because I'm, because I'm, I'm kind of with Horacio now, it sounds too good to be true at this point in time. But, uh, but, but I think that this, this particular story is, is one that, that deserves a, a, a longer, deeper look in Ireland. Um, and I'm so glad that we got to start this conversation here today. Um, I know it's happening in other places, but certainly for the rest of us, maybe coming from the software world who wouldn't be so familiar with it, um, I, I, for one, want to say thank you both and Scott for, for, for jumping in at, 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 at zero notice, really. Uh, and John, thank you so much for your presentation, but I want to say uh, goodbye to you both now for the moment because we are moving back into the world of open source software at this point in time for this next session that we have. Um, and I want to introduce to you Denise Cooper, who has been instrumental certainly in my own journey into this uh, world of open source. And certainly I probably wouldn't be here today were it not for meeting Denise a couple of years ago in near form because we're delighted to say that she uh, calls Ireland home now. Um, but uh, Denise has been an open source advocate for many, many years. Um, she has been involved in open sourcing uh, Sun's open office. She's been uh, involved in the open source strategies for Intel. She was CTO of Wikipedia, head of open source for PayPal. I mean, to be honest, we'd be here all day if I went into that, Denise, in terms of everything, everything, all, all your experience. But it's just of, because I'm old, right? <laughs> no, no, because you are experienced. But um, but I but I'm delighted that you can join us here today to talk about some of the myths that are there with uh, with open source uh, at the moment. Because when we think about open source software, sometimes the preconceptions are there from maybe a long time ago, um, and the industry and the ecosystem and the the community has moved on. So um, I'm delighted if you can if you can share with us some of the myths of open source software. Uh, that'd be fantastic. Thank you so much. I can totally do that starting now. Let me just go get to the sharing space and pick up my presentation, which is there. And we'll send it. Everybody can see that, I hope. Um, so it is true that I have worked forever in the industry and since basically the dawn of the open source movement. And I started out my open source journey at Sun Microsystems, which was uh, at the time selling most of the expensive bespoke hardware that was running the internet. And I remember the day early in my time at, at Sun that the sales force from um, London asked me to attend a meeting with Morgan Stanley at Canary Wharf for them because they didn't understand what the CTO was saying. And so I listened to him at this meeting and what he was saying was, we're not going to buy any more expensive Sun hardware because we're going to go with one use and uh, we're going to run Linux. So, you know, sayonara, basically. They could not comprehend it. So to the question of uh, vendors are smart, vendors are smart, but they're also really shuttered in their understanding. They, they tend to believe their own hype and it's a, a sea change like open hardware would be really confusing to them. So, okay, here we go. Um, first of all, uh, open source became a household word in about 2015. For those of us that started working on it in 1999 or 98, it felt like forever. <laughs> but all of a sudden, one day, people were mansplaining open source to me, and that meant that we had won. And that's good news, right? That means everybody can dive into the pool now. But there are still organizations that are just fundamentally getting it wrong. They don't understand and they haven't taken the time to understand. And a lot of the reason is because, as we'll reveal in a minute, some very organized uh, counter marketing that happened at the beginning of the open source journey has really institutionalized uh, in, in some places. So we're gonna talk about those myths that they seeded that are still common knowledge, but aren't even true anymore. So first of all, I have to say that open source is not a marketing exercise. And if you are considering entering into open source in name only for the halo effect, you're, it's not gonna go well. Um, people are pretty good at telling the difference these days and they're pretty good at calling people out and um, you know, making sure that that is not a successful strategy. So you, that, that's just a caution for you. Um, so, but, but as I said before, the myths are still totally getting in the way. And there are a lot of people who believe a lot of really erroneous things about, uh, about us, about open source. 
So first of all, why do you believe these myths? Well, because some big names told you um, for the entire 17 years leading up to open source winning in the marketplace, which corresponds roughly with Satya Nadella becoming the CEO of Microsoft, um, they were you know, actively pushing against open source because they felt that it was completely focused on their business model. So this poster about communism, open source is communism, that's a real poster <laughs> that Microsoft was sending around. Um, they were doing what's called fudding or fear, planting fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And this is a tool that actually IBM, I believe, um, invented, but Microsoft spent a lot of money and time explaining it that way around the world. And so if Microsoft is an anchor tenant, let's say Microsoft and Apple are anchor tenants in your tech tiger, and they're both saying open source is scary, then you're gonna institutionalize um, as a nation that you're, you know, the, bread, the side your bread is buttered on is not the open source side. But that's not true anymore. Since 2005, Microsoft has become a huge proponent of open source. They are in fact teaching open source collaboration style inside their company to try to revolutionize the way that they work. But they're also actively involved in projects like Azure, which if it was not open source, it wouldn't be relevant in the marketplace. So all the stuff that you heard 20 years ago, 10 years ago about how scary open source is, even the heart bleed incident, all of that was is blown out of proportion to make you afraid by proprietary vendors that want you to be afraid. But the good news is there are fewer and fewer of them and they really stand out these days. So let's talk about some of the specific stuff they like to say. And feel free to start asking questions at any point. First of all, the idea that you can't get support is, a, is one that they really like to plant. And the truth is, I mean, you just heard Scott Constable talk about his company. There is support available. And in fact, the most valuable transfer of company IP from in a merger happened between IBM and Red Hat last year. And Red Hat's main business is straight up support contracts. That's essentially what they offer. So they want you to use their version from you know, RHEL, but um, it's documented as open source and they provide full fledged support for it, some of the best support in the world. So you can absolutely buy support. You can buy support for the hardware, you can buy support for the software. You have to choose your vendors wisely. If you're just gonna go out on the internet and start downloading open pieces, that will be on you to support it <laughs> unless you, you know, approach with a strategy that allows you to say that you've got the support thing covered. Another one is that open source is built by the unwashed masses. This is a picture of Burning Man and they, a lot of open source developers go to Burning Man, but that does not mean that they're not good engineers. Um, Bill Joy, when I started at Sun, was not a big fan of open sourcing Java. He was, he was absolutely against it. However, he did want to explore open sourcing Solaris, which I think is interesting. And if they had done it in 1999, when I went to the first meeting about it, Linux probably would not have landed with, you know, such a crushing blow to, uh, to that company. Um, Bill Joy said at the time, we can't hire all the good engineers in the world. It's not fiscally possible for us to do that. But this, this network represents the best engineers in the world. And we know that because we can inspect their code Right, so the, the willingness to allow your code to be inspected pretty much automatically means that it's going to have better quality because people are, you know, this is about professional craftsmanship and people don't like to be embarrassed when somebody looks at their code and says, okay, you did this really stupid thing over here. So they're careful. They're careful because they know their code's gonna be viewed. Um, another big myth is that the security is poor. And there was a question already from, during the last talk about that by somebody who admitted she didn't know anything about open source. Um, this is, uh, there are some companies, <laughs> Oracle, who are still saying this and they're saying it because they don't have a better answer than to try to push fear. But it's a very old fashioned idea that stems from like World War II and before that when secrecy was really important. And you know, in Britain you could get killed for, for um, uh, not keeping the Official Secrets Act, right? Um, the idea that if things were transparent, they were less secure. Actually, today, things that are transparent are arguably more secure. 
There's lots of data that shows that most exploits are perpetrated by disenchanted employees in proprietary companies where the code is not being inspected very carefully. Most problems with open source software are diagnosed and fixed in very short order, like an order of magnitude faster. Now, the problem of whether the fix gets applied by the people who are actually using the code is a problem because we don't require that you do that. But um, for reasons, because we're engineers and engineers have reasons to not run upgrades. But we strongly suggest that security patches be provided. And there's a lot of public knowledge about them. As soon as a fix is made, there will be a concerted effort to get the install base to pick up that fix. So, you know, arguably this is this is a broken myth now. Um, the idea that it's somehow the Wild West that the, the way that choices are made is, is chaotic and uncontrolled. This is people who have never been inside of an open source project. I have worked for 40 years in this industry and for the first you know, 22, I was involved in both proprietary and then when open source came, I joined it. And I will say that I saw some very sketchy practices in proprietary companies and in open source, what I see is everything double checked and triple checked by lots of people and lots of interest in getting it right. So um, I think this is just a function of people not understanding the process. It is true that it's not in the hands of a product owner or, a, or an executive or somebody whose job traditionally is to you know, sort of lord over a well-defined process that they can stand up in court and defend. It's true that that, is, that part of the structure is not that important, but it's also true that engineers want to get things right. And public scrutiny means that you know, bad actors are pretty quickly found out. So um, I, this, is a, this is a wrong myth. Another one is that you can't make money doing open source because you can't patent things. Well, the truth is you can patent things. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. There are some restrictions in some open source licenses about how you can behave if you have a patent. So you are protected in an open source community by something called patent peace provisions from any other player injecting their IP into the open source community and then suing people for using it. They, they lose their rights if that happens. It's, it's a very clear violation of the way to work in open source. But there are lots of companies that still go and get patents and it can serve them. Um, it depends on what, what the patent is. And you know, I would say the patent system actually doesn't apply very well to software anyway. Only about a third of software patents are actually upheld. And that's in the US where business method patents are legal. In Europe, they're not even legal. So that means about half of the patents, maybe three quarters of the patents that are filed now are business method patents. So in Europe, it seems like a pretty silly um, idea to go deep on patents. It's just not, it doesn't pay. There are better ways to deal with um, your IP, but also you can make money and it is possible to pay. All right. There are people who have told me when I used to, I, I had a full-time job for 10 years flying around the world, legitimizing the open source movement to anybody who would listen. Sun paid me to do it for six years and then Intel paid me to do it for four more years. And I often heard, especially at the municipal and government level, that the proprietary vendors were holding up other parts of the system and didn't like it if they went to open source. So in India, where it was very clear that open source was a better deal, they would say, they would, they would definitely get what I was saying. They'd be with me until I said, so what about trying this? And they'd say, oh, well, you know, Microsoft pays for our higher education funds. And we can't afford to do our higher education without that money. And they don't like open source, so we can't do it. But I will say that um, as soon as Satya Nadella showed up, all of a sudden India was all in on open source. Like it was clearly a better way to go. Um, this picture is a picture of a, of a stencil that IBM put on the sidewalk in San Francisco the day that they announced they were spending a billion dollars to link their brand with Linux. This was in 2000. And um, there's an example, you know, there's that, there's that old saying, nobody ever gets fired for buying IBM. Well, what if IBM products are all open source and the underpinnings? A lot of them are now, a, a, a substantial number of them are, and nobody punishes you for work using them. So this is a myth. 
the idea that it's really hard to to keep track of the schedule and how things when things are going to drop is also an old fashioned myth and there was a time when some famous open source projects seemed like they never shipped but that has that has changed completely basically those projects fell by the wayside in favor of projects that were more consistent and these days most projects release pretty often sometimes too often for traditional uh, users and so what they've done is they've gone to a strategy of sort of golden builds like almost like major releases and then they'll throw a bunch of fixes and features into subsequent point releases but they'll always you know call out the major release and the reasons why people might want to update to it and those don't happen quite as often but um, there are projects that have been shipping on time with the projected feature list as planned for literally years now so this is not really this is not really a thing and then there's the licensing and this is the design this is the thing that i use to explain open source licensing i'm not going to have a ton of time to go deeply into it but i'll give you the short answer which will at least make you feel more comfortable um the, uh, outside of proprietary licensing which is not open source there are three major buckets of open source licensing um, over on the extreme left of this picture, there is inheritance or viral licensing. That's also um, free software licensing. And uh, it's also called copyleft. And this is the most, um, has the most obligations. It involves, uh, if you've used their software, and by the way, these all trigger on distribution except for one. Uh, that means that they were written before we stopped making shrink wrapped software. So, um, you don't owe anything to anybody if you don't actually ship software. So if you if your offer is a software as a service offering, then you get around all of this pretty much, right? Um, except for the Afero GPL, which is listed there, which uh, at the time that I made this graph was the only license that closed the performance loophole. So it, uh, it added performance as a trigger. Um, it's It was a controversial license at the time. There are a couple of other licenses trying to do that now. But the reason that hasn't been more broadly accepted is that, uh, first of all, people like permissive licensing. But second of all, that inherited licensing or, or um, viral licensing requires you to give, give back changes on anything that touches the open source code or the free software code that you're using. And um, that expanding that to or that you're performing um is you know scary to a lot of really big companies that are SaaS companies like google offers search as SaaS. they're never going to touch an afero license project right um in the middle you see hybrid we're going to skip that for now next to hybrid to the right we have permissive which some people say is like copy center licensing as in go down to the copy center and make as many copies as you want um, this is the license that allows you to use open source code without any obligations other than sometimes trademark and, of course, that patent piece obligation that I mentioned earlier. Um, BSD, Apache, and MIT are all in that same camp of permissive licensing, and they really drive open source now. There's more code under these licenses than under any other single license. And then in the middle, we'll come back to the hybrid license. In the early days of open source, there was a real effort on the part of vendors to have the best of both worlds. And the most famous of these hybrid licenses was the Mozilla public license. I wrote one later called the Cuddle, which was an which was a update on the Mozilla license. But basically what they say is treat this code as though it is permissively licensed. There is a picket fence around it called the API. And if you start changing the API, then you're gonna owe us those changes. So it's sort of we're your friend until you change the API and then you, and then it's going to be an inheritance license. Now you know everything you need to know. All right, that wasn't hard. Um, then the last big myth is that community is too hard. And I'm here to tell you people who believe this fail miserably at getting the benefits of open source because it's all about community. Just like this conversation we're having today is all about community. That's how you learn. That's how it happens. And and you actually don't have time not to build community. Um, it, there's been lots of studies that show that this is actually the secret sauce of open source. So, um, all right. So if you plan to do open source, you might as well do it right, right? And it's a lot of work and a lot of brand exposure and a fair amount of, of you know, relearning. So you might as well get it right. 
So I'm going to give you a very quick tool that I developed for one of my protégés back at PayPal to help him understand how to weed through ideas to open source. First of all, and this was the most controversial one at PayPal, does anybody beside your mom and yourself care if you do this? And the reason this was controversial was I was advocating for PayPal employees to go forth, go to meetups, make presentations about stuff they wanted to open source, and then see if anybody comes along after to ask them about it, you know? And if nobody turns up, maybe nobody wants it. And they need to, they need to know that because there's lots of money wasted by companies open sourcing stuff nobody wants. Okay, then there is, are you still using it? If you're not still using it, if you have an engineer who wrote something and you're gonna have to kill it for some reason and you don't want that engineer to lose heart, so you're thinking about open sourcing it for him, don't do that. Because honestly, there's only one project I can think of that that happened to that actually gained any kind of traction. Most of the time, it's a waste of time. All right, third thing, are you still improving it? That means, do you have staff involved in actively coding on this thing that people from the outside that want to use the code can talk to? Because you want to build a community. If you're not building community behind the code, you're not going to get any of the benefits of open source. So you have to be doing that. And that means you have to have people budgeted and time budgeted in that activity. And then last of all, once it's been open sourced, can you just work off one tree? Can you literally treat yourself as just another community member and stop having a special version that you've doctored that you're using for your own products? It's really counterproductive, but also it kills community if you are making innovations on your side that are not happening in real time on the public tree. Throwing your innovations over the wall all at once will kill the community faster than anything. All right, so I want you to hear that open source is a verb. There's activity to it. There's been a lot of FUD, we're trying to kill it now. And people that are on this call that are open source activists are all rolling their eyes because we've been having this conversation literally for 20 years because FUD is forever, it seems. But I'm here to tell you most of those things that keep you afraid of open source aren't even relevant anymore. All right, and I'm ready for questions, although I came in right at 20 minutes, we'll see if we have any time for them. Hi, Denise, and uh, thank you again so much for that. Um, I know, fantastic presentation in terms of like, yes, forever, but there's a whole brand new audience, I believe, that has never heard much about open source at all in the last little while. So hopefully we can, we can, we can, these messages can land on the fresh ears. So, uh, so it'll be, it'll be an easier journey uh, in some places. And speaking about the journeys, um, you are probably uh, best place. You've been very involved in the open sourcing of the COVID green app or Ireland's COVID tracker app. And yes. uh, just to kickstart the questions, and we do only have a short time, but one of them came into me uh, just online there. And it was basically from Sinead. And she was asking basically what your opinion is about the Irish Health Service and their choice choice to open source the COVID Green app, does that signify that they're on a journey to, to moving more towards open source? And where do you think they're on, on that journey and, and what the potential is there for, for, say, Ireland's health service and open source? God, I hope so, <laughs> is the first thing I want to say. Um, they were flabbergasted that that, that that worked. Initially, we open sourced that code so that privacy advocates would have a go at looking at it before we released it to the public because they were lining up to hate it before they'd ever seen it. And so we said, well, if we, if we publish the code, they can see that we actually designed this with GDPR in, in mind. In fact, it's the first app I've ever worked on that was so completely GDPR compliant. And as expected, the privacy advocates looked at it and said, wow, this is great. And the day that it was launched, they were all saying, use it, you know, which is, which is cool. Um, except for Trinity, uh, which has a longstanding feud with the HSC that I don't think that it had, what they had to say had anything to do with the actual app. Um, so, but then we open sourced it for the purposes of people picking up the code and using it. And there have been countries that have picked up that code base and are using it. Most Irish people don't realize that not only is our app used in most of the UK, it, everything except Little Britain itself, but it's also used in New York and in Pennsylvania and Delaware and New Jersey. And it's used by both um, Australia and New Zealand. They picked it up from the Linux Foundation project. So 
really, Irish technology provisioned the world on contact tracing apps. Um, yeah. The single yeah, most used one by, would, by, by a far number. I'll just, I'll just note that because uh, in the last event we had Barry Larry on and he was actually talking about how proud he was to have given something to New Zealand around COVID considering they were leading the field on, on many, on many, in many areas in that respect. So yeah. it's, it's fantastic. So that felt, that felt amazing. Now, now, right now we are at the point of needing a passport um, strat, I mean, uh, uh, so people can travel. We need a vaccination, va vaccination sure. validation system so that people, when you get on an airplane, they can believe that you were really validated, right? Because I have this little piece of paper. It's a real one, but there's nothing that distinguishes it from one that I faked, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so anyway, we're looking at that now, and unfortunately, uh, some people in the HSC have been looking at proprietary solutions for that. We are advocating an open solution that um, is coming from IBM and uh, it has a better chance of gaining deep adoption because it's coming from IBM and it's again, clear how it works, right? Um, and there are, to that whole, is it secure thing? There are people who are nervous that it's transparent so it can't be secure because they didn't just listen to my talk. You know, <laughs> they didn't hear what Diffie say, there is no statistical formula that shows us that one is more secure than the other, but just looking at how fast things get fixed in the open source community, you have to know that that's better, right? And he invented Diffie-Hellman encryption, which is why we can buy stuff on the internet. So it's a known thing among engineers in the know. The problem is transmitting that data to people who use technology, but are not technologists. Right. And, and I think, you know, the, the, certainly from a privacy perspective and from an open and transparent perspective, you know, from my thinking, thinking about that and how important it is as we move forward for the adoption of technology for people to feel safe with what they're using. Um, I think that that's an incredibly important uh, aspect of open source and one of the big benefits for citizens at large in the context of open source software versus closed source software, because it does it does mean that there's that extra layer of transparency and visibility that everyone gets. So not to mind the fact, even if you're never going to build on top of it and build an ecosystem or anything like that, just knowing that other people can access the code and check that out is, is, is an incredibly good thing. You know, the, the, simplest, um, the simplest real world example that most people understand immediately, um, if you've ever owned a, uh, high-end German car, you know that you're not allowed to open the bonnet and work on it because there are trained technicians that work on it and it's a closed system. You can't, some, yeah. some of them, you can't even see the inside of your engine. But, you know, those of us that have been driving for any length of time, remember a time when you could fix any car, um, particularly before they were computerized, you know, pretty much anybody could learn to fix their car. And so in the open hardware world, um, Bunny Huang, who's kind of one of the real gods of open hardware, used to have a t-shirt that said, if you can't fix it, you don't own it, <laughs> right? That's, this is true. And certainly when we start thinking about the circular economy that John brought up earlier, um, I think that, uh, you know, the more the more we think about reusability and fixability and all these things, uh, the more sustainable the whole industry will be. Um, so so thanks so much, Denise, uh, for that. Really, really appreciate it. I want to take this opportunity now, just before we bring in Deirdre, because uh, just just to, to tell people just around the Open Ireland Network. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a group and a community that have just literally banded together on LinkedIn for the moment. Uh, what I will say is that in July, we're planning to have a series or a number of working sessions where we actually ask people in the community to come together to look at some of the challenges and opportunities um, that surround the ecosystem in Ireland, in particularly looking at the skills issue and agenda because it came up a lot last time. Um, so I just want to put in that little reminder here to say, if you haven't already joined the LinkedIn group, please do so. And if you're interested in joining us for those conversations, please Please reach out because uh, we'd love to have you there. So um, I just want to put that in. But now I will say thank you again to Denise and I will welcome Deirdre Lee to uh, to the stage, as it were, our virtual stage. Yay. Yay. Thanks, thanks <laughs> and Deirdre, um, you know, I think one again, one of the things that surprised me when I came to look at this area, the whole area of open was when I started looking back into Ireland, were all these fantastic stories about what was happening in Ireland around the whole open ecosystem. And your name came up very, very early because um, your work uh, and Dairy Link's work 
uh, has been, you know, right at the top of the open data scene for, for many years. And I know that Derry Links has been involved in the creation and support of the Irish National Open Data Portal. But what I didn't know, which I saw from your, from your um, bio, was that Ireland has been ranked first in Europe in the EDP maturity index for our open data for three years in a row. And again, I don't think that most people in Ireland recognize the fact that Ireland is a leader in so many of these areas that we're doing such great things. So I am so delighted to have you here today and uh, welcome to you. Um, and uh, I'm delighted to hear a little bit more about the open data ecosystem because you know I'm coming at this from the open source perspective, open source software perspective, but uh, I know that the open data movement is probably a little bit more mature than the open source movement in terms of where it's got to in momentum in Ireland. Um, so really looking forward to hearing from you about that story and hearing a little bit more about that. So thank you, Deirdre, yeah. and I'll, I'll take it away. Thanks, Emily and Claire. Um, yeah, no, I'm like really kind of a, um, excited to be here and all of the, the the previous talks were really interesting and I think a really natural flow as well. I mean, from John and, and Scott, they around the open hardware, Denise uh, and open software, and hopefully the story around open data will be a, a natural progression from that as well. So um, while it's, it's a different area, there's a lot of things that I'm hearing that are, are very relevant for, for open data as well, just the, the approach, the premises and so on like that. So I'll just share my screen now, hopefully you'll be able to see the presentation. Um, yeah, so I'll kick off. And I guess I'm maybe aware that a lot of the participants here are more coming from the open source side um, or open hardware as well. So I'd be really interested in your feedback around open data. Um, because like, like everything, we are trying to raise awareness uh, around the open data movement here in Ireland, what's going on. Hopefully I'll give you an overview of where we've come from, where we're at now and, and the impact that it's having, which is most important. But, um, but yeah, it'd be great to kind of build up those links across the wider, wider open community, as, as Claire has been saying as well. So please, any questions or, or comments, just throw them into the question box there. So just very briefly, um, so I am founder and director of Dairy Links, and we are a company that leads LinkedIn open data initiatives. And um, so that basically means we provide fully hosted and managed data solutions for a range of different organizations, many of which in the public sector. So as Claire mentioned, we have built and we managed the national open data portal, data.gov.ie, which we'll talk a, a little bit more about as well. But we also work with a lot of other um, Irish government agencies, local authorities, smart cities, government departments um, around understanding uh, their data uh, holdings and how to publish open data as well. Also at a, an international level, we work with a number of mainly kind of um, development agencies such as World Bank, the International Aid Transparency Ishi Initiative, um, Open Development Mekong, again around uh, looking at how to publish open data for decision making, for transparency, for planning purposes and um, so a lot of different projects that, that we work on there and um, so today i'm going to give a, a brief kind of rundown of uh, what open data is what's driving open data here in ireland and um, that government buy-in piece which overlapped a lot of, of what denise was saying there as well and um, the practicalities of how open data is published the the portal here in ireland the impact because obviously we want to publish open data so that people can use it for uh, different purposes um, and also what's going on at an international level as well. So first of all, what is open data? Um, so if you're viewing data online at the moment, it can come in lots of different formats. And if you're a human, a person, person then it's usually um, optimized for you. So it could be PDF reports that are done. And especially from government agencies, they might have an annual report, a quarterly report, something like that. Um, the, it might be presented in infographics, like, so here's an example from the CSO, great visual aids of, you know, come some main statistics to, to understand a, a concept or an area, some maps that might be interactive, some dashboards, things like that. All brilliant, brilliant if you're a, a user, you just want to understand some information um, and, and move on and, and use that for, for whatever purposes. But if you are a data scientist, if you are a statistician, if you're a researcher, you might want to do a little bit more with that data other than just read it or get that information. You might want to carry out your own analysis. You might want to visualize it in different ways. You might want to um, aggregate it with data from other sources, from other um, public sources, or maybe from data that you collected as part of your own research, your own studies. 
And um, so if you want to do that, then it's very difficult to do it with these previous uh, purely visual um, formats. So for example, uh, a great example at the minute, which is really, I guess, again, just um, demonstrated the, the benefits and, and the need for data and how important information is as an information source. So for example, here we have the um, Ireland's COVID-19 data hub. Um, organized by HSE, OSI, um, under GeoHive. And, you know, on a daily basis, until the cyber attack, it was publishing the, the statistics around number of cases, deaths, hospitalizations, and so on. So people could understand what's going on. Very easy to read um, dashboard. They had some graphs, they had an interactive map, and so on, which was brilliant. But also, of course, around COVID, there's a lot of studies going around. There's a lot of research. People are exploring it themselves. So as well as just reading the, the high level data, people wanted to dig into that data. So it was really important that the raw data was also available. And all of the raw data um, around uh, COVID cases on a daily basis and hospitalizations, ICUs broken down by age and so on, um, are published on data.gov.ie. And so this was really important because from that, then we saw all of the different um, uses that were made from it. So of course, academics and in research institutes and in universities were looking at this data. There were hackathons, citizens were looking at, people were developing apps. It was appearing in media articles, which is how data should be used because um, I guess kind of when data is collected or um, when it's collected for a particular purpose, there's a lot of other use and reuse. We've heard a lot about reuse in, in previous talks as well, and um, that can be made from it. And in order for that to facilitate that reuse and make it as easy as possible, um, it should be made available in raw data format as well. So that's really kind of a, a great thing about the, the COVID data that has been uh, made available. And that's not only in Ireland, but internationally we're, we're seeing that. So, in order to drive um, evidence-based decision-making, rich business intelligence, advanced innovation, we need to be able to discover, understand, and access the raw data underlying uh, the elements. So open data is data that can be freely used, reused, and redistributed by anyone. So basically the data can be used for any purposes, including commercial purposes, because one of the benefits, I mean, a lot of the benefits of, of open data are around um, promoting transparency, engagement, but also economic benefit and promoting innovation. So that's kind of a purpose of, okay, we collected this information for a particular purpose, um, but it could be used for something else, even if it's kind of a part of a commercial ent entity, which is really important. Um, and something that we get asked a lot straight away when we start talking about open data is uh, privacy and personal data. So open data absolutely does not infringe on the privacy rights of indiv individuals under data protection legislation. So it doesn't include um, personal data that should not be in the public domain um, under GDPR or other data protection um, legislation. So if we look at this um, graph from the Open Data Institute, it kind of clearly shows the different levels of, of data. So here on the left, we have closed data. So for example, that's um, employment contract data, sales reports, data that is internal to an organization and will never be shared or made public. Then you might have kind of shared data that might be um, shared with particular groups for a particular purpose, maybe for um, research purposes or so on, but there's strict terms and conditions over that data sharing. And then very much on the right, you have data that can be shared with anyone for any purpose. Um, and that's what we're talking about with open data. We're talking about information about public services, statistical information, things like bus timetables, for example. And I'll talk a little bit more about it. There's obviously a lot of very rich um, data that can still be um, categorized under the, the open data and can be very useful for lots of different purposes as well. Okay. So what's driving open data here in Ireland? Um, so Claire mentioned that uh, the initiative here or, or open data is, is quite mature. Um, and I guess it is in that we have, so open data in its current form, or I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot of related areas such as um, freedom of information, public sector information and so on. But open data as it's um, currently presented uh, came from maybe around 2008, 2009. And, Ireland had launched its first open data, national open data portal in 2014. There were some local authority portals before that, Fingal County Council and um, the Dublin to Smart Dublin um, 
portals were available before that. But we're really seeing kind of open data grew from then and that the government at that time embraced it as well. So that's, I think, was a really important element um, of the evolution of open data here in Ireland. So we were delighted that in the um, European Data Maturity Study that's ran annually. So Ireland was ranked uh, a leader three years in a row. Uh, and we're currently still in the, the top, I think, three or four. Um, and we were also ranked um, third globally in the OECD Open Government Data Index. So we're really internationally recognized for, for the work that's been done as well. And that's on a lot of different elements. So it's from, a, from the portal and the technical and the data element, but it's also very much from the, um, from the policy side, from the governance, from the strategy, which I'll, I'll talk about in, in a moment. Uh, and then around the engagement and the um, impact piece, which is very important as well. So it's really kind of, when we're looking at open data, it's, it's really kind of the, the holistic, kind of the ecosystem of, of everything that's there. And of course, then it'd, it'd be great to increase the links between the, the open source community because it's, it's very much related. I'm sure a lot of you guys are, are using open data um, already in your work. So from a, an Irish legislation and policy, uh, perspective, there is the Open Data Strategy 2017 to 2022, which is currently actually being, being renewed, of course, for uh, in preparation for next year. But a really important part of um, Open Data here in Ireland is that it isn't just kind of one standalone strategy and it's like, okay, that's government policy over there, but then we'll deal with all the rest over here. But it's very much embedded in a lot of different Irish policy. Um, for example, the Public Service Data Strategy 2019-2023, Open Data is called out very, um, is highlighted there in the Public Service ICT Strategy, the e-government strategy, Data Sharing and Governance Act, and, and so on. So we're really seeing open data as being embedded in the wider government policy, um, which is a more realistic approach because it's not seen then as, a, as an add-on but something that's just part of the wider um, digital e-government data strategy across government organizations. And as I mentioned, uh, the public service data strategy, which outlines the um, approach for, for data management in, in government um, for, for these years, for the years to come, and um, data analytics and open data is highlighted as, as a, a critical component of that alongside base registries, uh, governmental standards, uh, data protection, um, and so on. So the Open Data Initiative itself, it sits in the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform um, under the minister there. So the Open Data Unit um, runs the Open Data Initiative and manages the Open Data Portal. So we'd work closely with the team there with uh, Rhoda Cairns and her team. Um, there's also the Open Data Governance Board, which is a group of independent advisors from industry, academia, media, civil society. So they um, advise and drive the implementation of the Open Data Strategy. The Open Data Advisory Group is a group of its representatives from public bodies. Um, so some of the, the leading publishers, maybe around 20, 25, um, to contribute to kind of where the strategy is going and kind of to share expertise, to define standards, things like that. And then as well, there's the Open Data Liaison Officers um, Network. So that's really in every single government department, agency, um, local authority. There's a dedicated Open Data Liaison Officer who is the contact point for Open Data. So this kind of governance structure really kind of, again, make sure that Open Data is embedded just across the public sector. Uh, and it's there. So there's a contact point there um, at every level that you're looking for. So that's kind of um, has been a, an important piece of the... I guess the movement in that it's very much kind of top down, as well as then kind of the demand for the practical demand for data coming bottom up from users as well, so that there's the structures in place. Another big driver has been from a European level, um, the Directive of Open Data and Reuse of Public Sector Information. So this directive, it was the PSI directive, it was revised in 2019, and it has to be transposed into national legislation across EU member states by July, so by next month, basically, <laughs> July 2021. Um, and this is really promoting an open by default approach. Um, so this is saying that we want to stimulate the publication of dynamic data, because maybe to date we've been looking at, okay, we just want to publish data and help people, help government agencies understand what open data is. But now it's, well, well we want really quality data that we can use for 
you know, not just one standalone bus time table, but the real time information of all where the, the public transport um, buses and stuff are um, and so on. So we want this kind of dynamic information, we, information we want it available by API. Um, it really kind of limits the exceptions that enable public bodies to charge more marginal costs. Um, the vast majority of open data is free and, and should be free. Um, the, it, it also extends the scope of directive to, to include data held by public underta undertakings and research data funded from public funding and, and so on. So it kind of extends the reach of the open data directive and who it applies to as well. Um, and it focuses on high value data sets. So I'll just talk a little bit about that, is that it's really kind of highlighting, okay, these are the areas that we recommend that the member states um, focus on when publishing open data. Geospatial, statistics, company and company ownership, mobility, earth observation and environment, and meteorological, which fits in, of course, to, um, for example, John was talking about the, the energy and the, the climate elements as well. So basically what's kind of important for, um, for decision making across the EU at the moment for, for, the, for, for a lot of the main topics. So, but they'll also, what will be coming down the tracks is that the, the EU will recommend specific data sets that should be made published, uh, should be publicly available as open data. So that's really important. So there's a lot kind of coming from the EU as well as open data where maybe Claire, there's a, a, perhaps a difference between the open source and open hardware community. I don't know, we can have a, a discussion around that, but it's good, I guess, that there is that kind of top-down approach that's driving open data as well. So the practicalities, how is open data being published? Um, so open data, from a technical perspective, it has to be accessible online in the raw data format, so downloadable or via an API. It has to be associated with an open license, so explicitly a license so that people, there's no ambiguity, can I use this, should I use it for this purposes, I don't know. The recommended license here in Ireland is the Creative Commons Attribution uh, 4.0, which basically means you can use it for any purpose, just um, include where the, the source um, attribute, the, the source where you got it from, and make the data available in open machine readable formats. So, yeah, the, the star rating is kind of how reusable um, it is. So we're looking at like three star open machine readable online. It could be linked data as well, if you're that way inclined, to make it kind of more reusable, more uh, linked using RDF and so on. Um, but here's an example of lots of different uh, open machine readable formats. So commonly used for structured or tabular data, CSV, JSON, and for geospatial, geo, uh, geojson or OGC geo packages for maybe domain specific like statistical there's px the data or json stat or so on so lots of different formats to choose from but that they're all kind of open um, and not proprietary and then finally that open data is associated with standardized metadata because of course understanding the context of um how the data was collected and uh, where it kind of came from but also what it contains whose contact points all of that so the recommended metadata it's a W3 standard, the data catalog DCAT, um, which we use here in Ireland, and it's internationally used as well for a lot of open data. Okay, so the, just see how we're doing on time. Okay, so the, the open data portal, um, I hope that many of you have already visited it, and if not, I, I encourage you to have a look, data.gov.ie. Um, so here's a picture of it. <laughs> um, it's it's a, basically a a catalog, an inventory of all open data sets that are available. So you can search by a keyword, by a themes, by categories, by formats, by publishers, and, and so on. Um, just a, a wee summary, there is over 10,000 data sets currently on the open data portal from 123 public bodies. Again, government departments, agencies, local authorities, uh, a broad spectrum. Some of the biggest publishers are the CSO, of course, the Central Statistics Office, really high quality statistical data. Met Erin, uh, Tusla, the HSC, Marine Institute, the Environmental Protection Agency, Ordnance Survey, Smart Dublin, and so on. So there's lots of data on there from lots of different bodies. Um, there's also uh, currently 669 APIs available because again, going back to the, the directive and the recommendation around dynamic data and more accessible data, um, having the information available as APIs is really important so that there's programmatic access to the data, um, but also it's easier to uh, maintain the um, access to the data, make sure it's kept up to date and so on as well. Because sometimes what we've seen in the past is maybe a publisher will you know, say, okay, I'm going to publish the data. I'll throw up the list of 
all the playgrounds in Donegal County Council and that's it, then it's now never updated again. Um, so we don't want information to become stale. So if that information is made available as an API, it's basically reflecting, it's updated at source, it's updated via the API as well. Um, and datagov.ie, it's only a catalog of data sets. So it, the data itself is not data storage, it doesn't host the data, but it harvests the metadata from um, over 15 different data catalogs. Uh, so for example, here we from HSE's eHealth Ireland um, data catalog, from Ordnance Survey, GeoHive, from Smart Dublin, from Cork Smart Gateway, from the CSO's uh, uh, um, Statistical Data Bank, from Department of Housing, the National Transport Authority, and so on. So it's pulling in all of this metadata on a nightly basis from all of these different data catalogs, data sources, websites, and um, to make sure that the data is kept up to date. And then of course there is manual updates and so on as well. And um, so the data sets can be like, sometimes, I mean, so there's 10,000 data sets, sometimes there can be a large quantity of data sets, but it can be maybe lots of data sets uh, divided into kind of similar tables, or there's a lot of information behind kind of one data set that's an API, but of course, using an API, you can filter down into the information that you want. Um, so lots of information there. And I guess I just wanted to mention, especially in this group, that the technology that datagov.ie and a lot of the open data portals, well, all of the ones that Darylink support are based on open source um, software. So we use the CCAN um, data management platform, um, which is an open source uh, project. So we build on top of that um, and we kind of uh, customize that for the different portal needs, if it's more kind of on user engagement or data access features or, or whatever else. But we're very active in that CCAN community as well and can plug back in and we find kind of from our customer point of view that they really like that part that I mean they kind of see that open data and open source go very much hand in hand and like that it's based on a open source technology and open source stack and something that other governments and public other um, public agencies internationally are using as well because this is used by UK, US, Australia and um, really kind of all over the world I think there's got how many, maybe 3,000 um, installations of, of CCAN. I could be corrected, hold on. <laughs> okay, so to talk a little bit now, I'm nearly done, but I just wanted to kind of mention um, around the impact of open data. So it's all well and good having all of this um, information out there, um, but kind of what, what is it used for? Kind of the question from public bodies, why are we doing this? So I talked earlier on about the, the impact around the, the COVID data, which is absolutely huge. And we've been, seen the, the number of visitors that are coming to the site that are looking at the, the data that are using it um, has absolutely you know, um, grown a lot um, over obviously the last year as well. But some other like kind of areas that really kind of the, the impact of open data can be seen hugely. So one of those is mobility, um, which is again, one of the high value data sets recommended in the directive. Um, so this is an area where there is a lot of open data available because of course, I mean, it's, I guess, you know, there's not a lot of personal information there. So it was one of the early adopters of, of open data, I'll say as well. So there's a lot of information from the National Transport Authority, from, um, from local authorities uh, and so on as well. So here on the left, we have an example from the real-time passenger information. So if you're ever at a, a bus stop or a Lewis stop and you see the, the real-time, when's your next bus coming? So all of that is available via an API and uh, managed by the National Transport Authority. And it's one of, it's like the most um, used um, open data sets or, or APIs that we have available on the platform. And recently they actually had, the NTA had to update the um, API because really the infrastructure just couldn't handle the amount of hits it was getting. So I think it was 20 million hits per year. And that's probably increased by now as well. So we updated the, the entire infrastructure um, supporting the API, which was a, a REST API, but they also um, you know, know their users, know their community, so engage with them. And they also updated the um, standard that the API uses. So now it's a GTFS R, um, which is a real-time general transit feed specification. So specific to the transport domain as well. So it's a more standardized way of accessing it, which is brilliant because it's, uh, more reusable but also more interoperable because if the users are using that feed and maybe kind of other uh, standardized feeds from other sources as well it's easier to bring that information together so that's a, a super use and um, from smart dublin we have worked with them a lot on um publishing a lot of the bike information so they have the, the dublin bike the real-time information was available but not the historical and if anyone wanted to do kind of analysis on the 
the, I guess, the stations when bikes were there or not or so on, that wasn't available. So we built an API to facilitate that. And uh, Moby bikes data, the um, bleeper bikes and cycling lanes, and there's lots of other kind of cycling information that's available. And that's used, of course, with a lot of, lots of applications. And just an example is the Dublin Cycling Buddy app, which was launched in the last couple of months by Dublin City Council. But of course, it's because it's available as open data, as APIs, it can be used by anyone for any purpose for any other application as well. So another example is the City Mapper, which is an international company, and they uh, provide guides, travel guides that incorporate public transport, uh, cycling, walking, um, whatever for all cities. And they, again, kind of uh, recently added Dublin. So they're using a lot of the, the open data that will be published um, uh, around Dublin, along as along with data from their own sources and other feeds as well, which is really kind of where we see the, the sweet spot as open data. Maybe originally it was thought, okay, we'll publish this little bit of open data and it's like one open data set, one use, here's an application using that and that's how we're going to measure impact, but that's not how, how it has worked at all. It's really about open data is available here and then the user will pick a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and a little bit of their own information or their own data from other sources as well to use it for their own purposes, be that to build applications, to inform decisions, to do their own analysis or, or whatever else. So the data interoperability and linking is super important. And just one other example of a, an area where there's kind of huge impact and huge potential for open data is around the, the climate change area. So we, um, Darlings, we held, we hold kind of regular um, open data impact series that were face-to-face -face events, events, which were great, but now they're, they're online um, sessions where we bring together open data users and publishers. But our last one was actually on climate change and it was just fascinating, the different speakers that were there. And um, so some examples were, for example, from, um, I think Jamie Cudden from Smart City, he was talking around the, the flooding data that's been collected and used. So um, Dublin, so Smart Dublin as part of Smart Docklands um, have published a lot of different flooding information. And as well, I just included a picture here. This is from the Open Topographic Data Viewer. So the OPW um, publish uh, data from their flood risk management projects via, via this viewer as well. Um, and they're used then, of course, for, for anything kind of around um, flooding projects. And one would be kind of, for example, the Operandum, which was an EU project. A run out of UCD was one of the partners um, and they developed nature-based solutions to manage hydrometeorological risks, which was really interesting. But then the same data is used, for example, with a collaboration that Smart Docklands are doing with SoftBank, so a, an industry partnership. But again, they want the same information, the flooding information, to be able to do their analysis uh, around that area as well. And then another speaker at the event was from uh, Mare, which is a, an SFI research institute, uh, Bri Professor Brian O'Gallagher, and he kind of was basically saying that all of their work is um, depends on open data from, from CSO, from Airgrid, from SEAI, from Department of Housing, from just kind of across the board, because what they do is they look at um, like what's kind of going on reality in their areas of um, climate, marine and, and energy. They develop models around that, take in the data, do their analysis, develop scenarios, and then compare those uh, model results. So for example, this was one of the, the screenshots from, from uh, Professor Brian's talk around um, modeling Ireland's energy system in 2019, and really clearly using that data to say, okay, where is the energy coming from? And um, what's the primary kind of uh, use of that use of that data and then kind of modeling that so in 2030 where could that be where should that be and, and so on but of course they're experts in their field and they use data that they collect in their own research as well but being able to source the open data really helps to um, enhance the information and what they can do there so just some simple examples and that whole um webinar is available the recording's available online if you want to follow that as well Okay, and just very briefly to mention that, so I've, I've talked, of course, I've, this is Open Network Ireland, so I focus very much on the Irish story, but open data is something that's happening no more than open source software um, and open hardware kind of internationally. So we're seeing, this is just a, an example of the Open Data Baram Barometer study, which kind of measures um, who's signed up for the Open Data Char Charter and where different countries are at. It's just one metric, like the European data study that I mentioned earlier on. Um, but yeah, kind of a, across the globe, basically, that open data is kind of increasingly becoming 
not only a, a nice to have or kind of a community thing, but very much a government policy because a lot of the open data is published from governments, but it's also coming from academic institutes in terms of open access and scientific work from sustainable development organizations, like I mentioned a lot that we work with, um, and then increasingly from industry. So it's, it's still kind of slow at the minute, but uh, again, there's a lot of uh, potential there for sharing for collaboration purposes, for transparency purposes, and, and so on. So I think we'll see more coming from industry um, as we move forward. And yeah, I don't know how I am on time, but this was just a, an example of the open data energy side of things, or sorry, from the internationals. We're working with the World Bank on their energy portal. They publish, it's a, I think a really nice example because they're very focused. This is the energy and extractives uh, general practice within the World Bank. Um, so they publish um, open data. So they've currently, um, uh, 854 data sets there in the portal but we also work with them to develop a number of applications that really use this data for specific purposes so that's kind of a really nice thing because they have you know another number of projects that are ongoing a number of uh, people working in the field who have specific problems and they want to use this open data to be able to solve that so here's just kind of a couple examples and all of these apps are available on the, the site as well so it's kind of a very clear here's the data and then here's the applications that's kind of built from this data in this in the sphere of um energy and extractives like the global electrification platform um helps try to uh, kind of model the least um cost electrification strategies using kind of country information and investment scenarios and, and so on as well. So it's just uh, some nice examples internationally as well. So that's it from me. Um, I'll just leave you. If you kind of want to sign up to we hold loads of different events um, throughout the year, together with um, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform and other um, partners that we have. And we've one coming up on the 30th. It's kind of targeted at publishers at public bodies, but you're listening. Anyone's welcome if you want to, to come on board. It's around the open data technical guidelines. So basically um, how data is published um, and in the best way. That's it. Thanks a million. Thank you so much, Deirdre. That that was a, a whirlwind tour and it was just yeah. fantastic though to see how much has been going on. Uh, you know, it, it really does strike me that like when I said that the open data has had more momentum, is more mature, it's definitely more um well well known in terms of Ireland, in terms of the benefits. So that's pretty obvious from uh, from what you've described there, which is fantastic. I, I have one quick question because I know we're we we we're kind of running over, but but it's 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 more to say, like you mentioned about the fact that the open source hardware is uh, is very, um, you know, commonly used in the open data ecosystem in terms of the platforms that you use and things like that. Um, I'm just wondering, are you seeing more of the applications that use the data be open sourced? And I'll tell you why I'm asking, because it, just even specifically what your 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 transport data uh, uh, example uh, sparked for me, I, I, I work as part of a, an OSPO++ network, which is a, a network for open source program offices and universities and governments. And one of the uh, participants just uh, a few days ago was saying about the fact that they were they were thinking about how when they had their open data in the city in 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 the US wouldn't it be great if the same app would be used in all the cities to get the standardized open data because like why would everyone why would each city build it separately right so if we, if we have cycle buddy here now in dublin why could not cycle buddy be used in every city in the world to do that if there's standardized data i mean surely that would be a great efficiency for the world over so you've seen a trend to see more of those applications be built with open source um yeah i guess kind of my, my initial response would be yeah absolutely i mean kind of a lot of the open data community would be kind of on board with open source and kind of use open source in their own kind of development and then in that way kind of um share on you know their source code or the applications on, on github or so on um i guess kind of because of the nature of open data the whole point is that it's as easy as possible to use so you can go and, and download or access the, the information so to really understand who the users are is not that straightforward so it's not kind of like maybe in a, an open source community there's it's a community of known people because it's the people who you know, um, push your code to, to GitHub repo or whatever. So there's not that in open data in that anyone can take it down. So it's a bit the invisible user. So we can look at metrics and things like that. And then we can try and engage with the community. So I would say kind of from the, the known users, um, yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, a lot of the people then would be, and maybe if they're using it, especially for, for research purposes, for academic, for their own personal, then, then for sure. 
um, I guess there's a lot of users that we don't know or that are specifically using it maybe as part of decision making for their own companies like you know should we expand into this area what's the um, you know kind of what's the footprint what's the noise quality what's the demographic whatever if people are using that kind of information then we just don't know that um, and I guess it is its its use is for commercial purposes so I'm sure it is being ingested in a lot of proprietary you know it's using google maps it's using city map or things like that and that's absolutely fine but um but yeah though generally would be beneath this and i think kind of the example of the the city app that you gave there i think government bodies are very much on board so like the smart dublin smart cork of this world definitely would love that if applications could be used or developed for their local authority for their city that it could be reused they would absolutely embrace that because that kind of stands side by side with the whole kind of um, smart city approach as well well that sounds like uh, open data definitely has the the is is the fuel to the open source software side of things in terms of application development so we'd certainly look forward to that development happening in ireland so thank you again so much dear for sharing that with really really appreciate it and i would like now finally um and a little bit late so apologies to leslie but i would like to invite leslie hawthorne uh, now to the stage thank you so much deirdre um and leslie uh just wanted to introduce leslie from red hat uh, she's part of the open source program office there in red hat and she's an open source strategist and um has had many many years of community engagement around uh open source and we're delighted to have leslie here today because we were just talking about the impact of open data with smart cities and this has been a theme around environmental and society impact of all the types of open um, and delighted to have Leslie here today to talk a little bit about smart cities and open source and open standards um, and I'll let you take it away Leslie. Excellent thank you kindly Claire for that lovely introduction. Uh, I will go ahead and do my very best to share my screen correctly. Is everyone able to see my slides? We are. Excellent all right. Uh, so folks, uh, just to give you a bit of background on uh, my own personal passions for and work around smart cities, uh, as the manager of vertical community strategy at Red Hat, one of the things that I looked at, look after is uh, Red Hat's engagement with public sector communities in uh, EMEA. Greetings to everyone from Bonn, Germany. Uh, so I, I have the opportunity to uh, work in the smart city space because it is a personal passion of mine. Uh, as the mother of a disabled child who is not sighted, uh, it is actually really important to me that one day I know that my daughter will walk through a city and she will always be able to uh, cross the street when it is safe. So uh, if you hear a deep, a deep swell of passion in my voice, it's because I not only have um, almost 20 years of experience working in open source software communities and understanding their, their genuine power to change the world, but also because I'm deeply motivated as a mom. So let's go ahead and uh, jump into the meat of our material. So for those who are less familiar with the topic of smart cities, it's the easiest way to, to conceptualize the, the notion is that uh, there will be widely deployed sensor networks within a city that will feed all kinds of data back to a central hub and also interact with uh, user devices as they move through that urban environment. And this could be everything from uh, communication between your smart car with uh, you know, traffic light systems to rearrange traffic patterns based on uh, trying to alleviate congestion, to uh, you know, re uh, sensors throughout the city to measure for air quality, to something as, as simple and wonderful as noting that the public waste bins have become full and it would be wonderful if we sent someone to empty them. Uh, and it turns out that there is a, a, a huge impetus to build out these smart city solutions in an open source and open standards based context because uh, there's there's several reasons for this I don't know that I need to sell anyone on this uh, wonderful event about the power of open source and open standards but the by creating our solutions based on open source software and open standards we're able to produce um, solutions that are auditable, repurposable, uh, and able to be uh, shared widely across municipalities, not just in any one particular geography, but across the world. I'm going to touch on that a bit more in the next slide. So uh, in addition to, to the benefits of um, you know, code reusability and cost savings associated with being able to reuse and repurpose solutions, I think it's also important to think through the implications for uh, citizen sovereignty, citizen private, privacy, and uh, you know, really European values when we're looking at the architecture of smart cities from an open source and open standards perspective. 
Um, if we know that our code bases are auditable and we know that they are, these are standards-based solutions, we can be more assured that the way in which data collected upon our citizens as they move through these smart cities is going to be used in a way that is in keeping with the common good and not used in a way to target any underrepresented group or to uh, behave in any other way that we would consider contrary to, to European values and that is not pro-social. And once again, that is the power of open source software. Since that code base is open, it is available to anyone with an interest and a passion to audit it and assure that the way it is working is, is working is intended and is expected. Um, there's also, uh, I think the importance of understanding the value of open source software from a, from a cost savings, but also an, an evolutionary, not revolutionary perspective. Um, there is no city that is going to wake up overnight and suddenly become smart as because we cannot rip out all of our technological systems and simply replace them as a whole. Um, the city of Bonn where I live is I think celebrating its 225th anniversary today and has been uh, continuously settled since the times of the Roman Empire. It is not as though the folks here working on smart city solutions are going to be able to rip out the entire civic infrastructure and replace it. But if we do create solutions based on open source and open standards, there's the opportunity to, to integrate effectively with legacy systems. And as the new systems that we architect today themselves become legacy, extend those systems and make them uh, continue to be useful and interoperable with whatever the next iteration of development is in order to um, architect the citizen-centric smart city. So when we think about uh, the values of, of smart cities, like what, what should they be and what should we look to do when we, we create the smart city? I really look to the, to the values enumerated in the Berlin Declaration of 2020. So this was uh, a declaration signed very late last year. And uh, you know there were many points in the declaration about the, the use of technology and to make sure that it was used appropriately and in keeping with European values. But these are the three that, that stuck out most to me, this idea that, excuse me, Pardon me, folks. This idea that um, the purpose of, of technology is to enhance social participation and inclusion, right? Technology is not there to build systems that um, work only for a few and therefore uh, serve the needs only of a few and then end up serving the needs of no one. Um, and this also this concept of strengthening trust uh, amongst users of technology through security in the digital sphere. So we're not only looking to create systems that are open and auditable based on open standards, but we're also looking to the promise of open source software to provide us with software that is more secure because those code bases are fully auditable and anybody can take a look at how the software is functioning and, and find vulnerabilities and bugs in that software and, and to be able to remediate them that much more quickly using um, the wisdom of the crowds. Uh, and finally, this idea of using value-based and human-centered artificial intelligence uh, systems for use in the public sector. So uh, as someone who was born and raised in Silicon Valley and has probably called Europe home since, uh, since 2014, you know, and, and as an early employee for a US hyperscaler, I'm, I'm keenly aware of the ways in which artificial intelligence um, can be used to, uh, to track and manipulate human behavior. And this, this idea that as we are moving into a future in which artificial intelligence has both promise and peril, that there is a commitment on the part of European public sector agencies. And you know, conversely, the folks who are doing urban planning and, and architecting these smart cities for our citizens to ensure that the, the artificial intelligence that they are using in order to create these smart cities is again, values-based, human-centered, and is, uh, is laser focused on creating social good. So uh, I just wanted to touch on briefly three uh, smart cities projects, some of which folks on this call I'm sure know more about than I do, just to give folks a, an idea of uh, if this is an area of interest for you, places where you could go to learn out more. These are um, two of the communities I personally participate in. They are deeply welcoming and would uh, love to have more folks showing up to provide their perspectives and their contributions. So the first one that I wanted to touch on is the Fiware Foundation. And the Fiware Foundation is not just a group of uh, individuals and community members working in the smart city context. Uh, they actually have programs within the foundation to develop solutions for uh, smart energy, smart industry, and smart agri-food along with smart cities. Um, but as with all things, uh, it's not as though these things do not uh, overlap with one another, right? For example, the smart city uh, we would hope would have uh, access to 
areas to grow food for its citizens rather than transporting that food in from long distances, uh, et cetera. So the, the FIWAR folks have um, created many different avenues for engagement with their community, including development of actual software that is released under the FIWAR Foundation. They have also created a marketplace of businesses who are implementing FIWAR solutions in order to serve uh, municipalities who are looking to deploy smart city solutions and also for uh, training and support on those solutions as a means to uh, speed the rollout of smart citizen centric solutions as quickly as possible. There's a ton of European cities who have uh, deployed fire based solutions, including uh, places in France, Belgium, Germany, Spain, and beyond. And if you are interested in learning more about uh, Fireware and its applications in smart cities, you can just visit uh, the short URL that I've listed on the slide. And there's a, a comprehensive white paper of about 15 pages that will walk you through everything that Fireware is doing in this domain. Uh, another community group that I'm particularly excited about, I only learned about them recently, is uh, the group called Open and Agile Smart Cities. And this is a, a group of individuals who are coming together to, um, to both build tools and to share best practices around um, building uh, citizens, smart citizen-centric solutions. That was difficult to say. Smart citizen-centric solutions built on open standards and open APIs. And in, in addition to creating a, a community gathering place and a network for folks who are working in the smart cities domain, they're also committed to maintaining something that they are calling their, their catalog of best practices. And this is a set of how to implementation guides for various smart solutions that are contributed by member cities uh, back into the catalog. And one of the uh, aspects of it that I particularly appreciate is if you look at the, the catalog information page, it says very clearly on the front page that nothing will be published in the catalog unless it is a real world deployment along with details on um, you know, successes, failures, and lessons learned. So this is, a, this is a community that is helping to take folks through this, this transition to, to smart solutions, not only from a uh, getting together and network uh, as humans perspective, but also in sharing out those best practices across the entire world. So that those who, who, who may be far away um, from events that are taking place here in Europe are able to share in with, uh, with the knowledge sharing and with the collaboration. Uh, then, Last but not least, I wanted to, uh, to take an example from the home of uh, the folks that I'm speaking to today. So the spotlight on Cork, and I apologize because I assume that there are folks in the audience who know far more about what's going on with smart cities uh, in Cork than I do. Uh, and I chose Cork because I have a number of friends who, who live in Cork. Um, and they have, uh, they have told me about some of the, the work that they have done using uh, the Cork dashboard to do some um, open data analysis and queries using uh, data geo uh, geodemographic data for Cork and, and learning more about their city when they had just newly moved there. Um, and the, the smart gateway, which includes the Cork dashboard, um, it, this is an umbrella home for projects, including uh, several folks working in the sustainable energy community. So this is a project which actually engages citizens of Cork in collaborating and co-creating their own sustainable energy system together so for, for uh, the benefit of all of the citizens of Cork to be able to not only um, collaborate together on around an open source and standards based solution, but also to improve the state of the world through having an immediate impact on climate change right in their own community and working together. And I, again, I think this speaks to the, to the great power of open source. It's not just that there's software and it's not just that everyone has the ability to use it. It is this ethos of working together to solve a common problem that I think is so, so very promising and instructive to all of us as we face um, some of the difficult challenges before us as, as the human species. So uh, I will conclude just by saying, I think uh, fundamentally the promise of smart city solutions is, is that these, this work is, is focused on the most important, you know, one of the most important aspects of our lives. If we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we have food, we have clothing and we have shelter. And, and as we look at the uh, predicted, you know, not exponential, but vast rise of the world's population moving to urban centers, if we do not create uh, solutions to account for that population increase and also to adapt for things like, like climate change as well, uh, we're not going to be able to, to architect a future that is effective for everyone. And when I look to uh, my friends in Europe, some of whom are um, excited about the idea of building European technology only for Europeans, I am reminded that 
um, that some of the most brilliant innovations in, in the fireware community, which is, you know, staffed almost entirely by folks from Europe is funded with uh, EU funding for the Horizon campaign of uh, research grants. And yet some of the, the most impressive deployments that serve the, the greatest number of citizens are actually taking place in India with um, networks of over 100 cities. And so as we look to create these, these solutions for the future that literally are at home where we live, uh, I think it's important that we we realize that this this sharing and this creation of mutual value is uh, underpinning the tie that binds all of us together, which is our common and shared humanity and building something that works uh, so that all of us can benefit and move forward beautifully together. That is all I have. Uh, and I will turn the mic back to Claire that she may request audience questions or whatever our fabulous host shall do for us. Thank you. Thank you. So much, Leslie. Thank you so much. It's a, every time we talk, I learn so much. I had no idea about Cork, Limerick, Dublin, and Galway being involved in said network. So uh, it's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. And uh, it's fantastic to see what's happening there. Again, it, this is exactly why it's so important to to bind together all the folks here that are that are interested in this because um, we can all learn so much from each other. So so thank you for that. So you you used an example from Ireland there, and I think that's fantastic. We'll have to reach out to those folks and find. Out more about what's happening in each of the cities um, and I just I'm just kind of curious to think from your perspective like looking at this at a regional or even a global basis are you seeing a big move in smart cities towards that work for shared humanity for that sharing are you seeing a trend shift there in terms of people embracing open source software as part of that journey so so I think that to to a large extent as as folks are architecting these smart solutions there was a bias toward open source from the very beginning just because so much of it involves technologies that were being actively developed and actively brought into the public mind when open source had to some extent if we think back to denise's talk about you know open source becoming a household word in 2015 you know ai machine learning all of the latest libraries and frameworks for that are open source from day one by default um, what I do see, though, that I find to be extremely heartening is if I look at the different places in which folks are looking at um, creating not just solutions for social good, but also for for economic mobility and for profit. Um, there, there sometimes are uh, there are sometimes folks who are who are deeply concerned with uh, you know making sure that their their company, their city, their country, their region is the is the one to reap the benefits of the work that they're doing. Uh, and I don't see that within the smart cities community, right? These folks are 100% focused on collaborating across borders, across the world, and also uh, sharing the stories of people from places where typically we do not hear about their accomplishments and, and what is going on, right? Like I, I had no idea that there were 113, I think 113 fireware based smart cities in India until, you know, attending the fireware festival a couple of weeks ago. And again, this is, this is not the kind of thing that typically hits our radar. And yet, these solutions is very much a rising tide lifts all boats and we're all in this to be better together. So that's quite good. That's absolutely fantastic. And let's hope that when people see other cities adopting this, then, then it's also a model for how quick and easy this can happen and, and the benefits it can get. And maybe we can introduce a bit of FOMO going on any, anywhere where they're not going so that we can see we can, what we hear about the brilliant stories that are helping elsewhere. Well, Leslie, thank you so much. I'm sorry that we're, we're run to time, but I, but I want to respect people's time on the call. Um, if people have questions for Leslie, um, she's so fantastic that I'm sure she'll be able to, to to answer them offline uh, for us and we can share them in the Open Ireland Network. I want to make one big uh, thank you to everyone who came here today. Um, uh, thank you so much for attending and please do uh, join us in the Open Ireland Network on the LinkedIn group. We will be providing different places to, to, to join us in the future. But right now, if you join the LinkedIn group, that would be just look up our Open Ireland Network or if there's us there <laughs> um, and, uh, and join the community. That would be fantastic. I want to say a big thank you to the ICT Technology Ireland um, Skill Net, uh, ICT Skill Net for their help and support and partnering in, in hosting this event. But most of all, I want to say thank you to our fabulous speakers, uh, John Laban, uh, Deirdre Lee, Denise Cooper, and Leslie Hawthorne, and in fact, Scott, who, who turned up unexpectedly. But, uh, but thank you to all of you. And thanks again to everyone who came today. I hope we will see you at the next event. And please do stay in touch. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. <laughs>